Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So just at the end of last year, I stumbled across a feature that RME, the manufacturer of audio interfaces and converters and stuff, um, they, they released a new update of their total mix FX software for their interfaces that came with a new feature that got me really excited. Something that I've been thinking about for a while now that to me at least makes complete sense and should be in integrated into every single interface for home studios. And that is speaker calibration. EQ, delay, and volume on every channel, on every output channel of your interface. And this hasn't been the case for any interface as far as I've known. I've been kind of bodging together solutions like this for a while now, and I've always wondered why don't in interface manufacturers implement these features into their interfaces? And then RME came along and did it, and I was just like, Poof! there it is. And this is what I wanna share with you in this video. But before I do that, if you're in the process of treating your home studio and you're kind of getting stuck on certain things, don't know what to really focus on, you got a certain problem and you don't know what it is you actually need to look at to solve that problem, I want you to download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. Let me help you out with that problem. These are my five steps to treating a home studio and getting it to translate. But more importantly, it gives you all the steps that you need to take to take your room from untreated to fully treated, getting your mixes to translate in your studio. And it takes you through all those steps in the right order. And it shows you what to focus on at each of those steps and what to ignore. So for example, obviously placing your listening position and speakers, setting up your desk, planning your treatment, porous absorption, resonance absorption, setting up a subwoofer, speaker decoupling, measurements with Room EQ Wizard, how do you integrate all of that into a system, a step-by-step -step process that you can follow where they all fit together, where it all makes sense, where they all come together so each step builds on the one before it and you don't end up turning in circles. But also, so you know that if you have a certain issue, for example, if your low end is unbalanced, how do you go about figuring out what it is you missed in order to get that back into balance? So that's what the Home Studio Treatment Framework is for, a top-level perspective to guide you through the process of treating your home studio. So if that's you, if you need help with the treatment of your studio, make sure you download it. It is absolutely essential, completely for free at the link in the description. But so let me show you what got me so excited about this update to Total Mix FX for RME interfaces in terms of the broader spectrum inter interfaces and why I think this is such a crucial thing it's a real game changer, in my opinion, in the world of home studios. Basically, here's what I found. So this is kind of the, the forum post, typically understated RME fashion. They just <laughs> released a forum post showing this new feature. So it's Room EQ and Crossfeed preview for their UFX Plus, UFX2, and UFX3 interfaces. And so it's basically a nine band parametric EQ, delay, volume, calibration, and cross feed for the outputs of their interfaces. And the reason this is so important, in my opinion, is that in a home studio, we are forced to work in a room that was never meant to be used for professional audio, for critical listening, for unaltered audio consumption, if you will, right? And because of that, there are certain aspects of this entire acoustic system that are very difficult to kind of go the entire mile with, right? So one of the things that is really difficult, and that's the whole reason why speaker calibration software exists, is that getting a flat frequency response or a balanced frequency response, let's call it a neutral fre frequency response, whatever you want to call it, is very, very tricky, even with extensive treatment. Yeah, so, and that's why I recommend that you implement some sort of speaker equalization at the end of your treatment process. It's one of the major steps of treating a home studio because getting a balanced frequency response is extremely difficult in many, many home studios. Unless you build the room from scratch for the purpose of sound, 
it will be very difficult to get a balanced frequency response. And so this feature of equalization, of equal, equalizing your speakers is super useful. You want to minimize its use, but it is very, very useful. And obviously we've had products, speaker calibration systems like SonarWorks. We have the Newman MA1 system. There are a bunch of other kind of manufacturers who've implemented either on the speaker side or in dedicated software side, this kind of speaker calibration. But ever since I've been messing around with these, my thought was always, why doesn't this exist in the audio interface? Yeah, that's that's where it needs to happen because usually there's already latency involved with these systems. And so you can use the existing latency in the interface to pack in some EQ and some other functionality in the form of a digital signal processing instead of adding it on top in the form of extra software or even in the speakers themselves. Still, the kind of functionality that is either built into the speaker or into these software packages usually isn't enough. It usually is only EQ, which is great, but we also need delay and more useful volume settings, if you will, right? But let's start with delay. Why is delay so important? On one hand, because we want the sound from our speakers, both our speakers left and right, to arrive at the listening position at the same time, basically in time and in phase. Usually that's solved by positioning, but sometimes there's slight misalignment there, and then it's useful to have that feature. It's one of the steps that creates a clearer, more precise stereo sound stage between your speakers. But on top of that, where it really becomes useful is when you're tying in a sub. And this to me is kind of the, the biggest win here because this is the, the one thing where the pro audio, studio audio industry has failed to produce any type of useful solution up to this point. The problem is that you need to tie in a subwoofer into your system, to your speakers, both again in time and in phase. And unless, to this point, unless you've bought a subwoofer from the same brand as your speakers, and it was built in conjunction with those speakers, as in it was meant to be used with those speakers, and you set it up in a way that it was intended to be set up as they kind of designed it into that package when they first designed the product, unless you fulfill all of this, those requirements, it is unlikely that you can actually tie in the sub correctly, as in it is often impossible to do it because you need to be able to delay the subwoofer. This has been the case in sound system design for 10 years plus. It's been the absolute, well, it's been the norm. And for some reason that never crossed over into the studio world when it is actually critical to tying in a subwoofer, to getting a time and phase aligned crossover between your speakers and your sub. And if you don't get that right, you get a chance of cancellation depending on how big that mismatch is that can in its worst case, be make it impossible to kind of hear what is going on in that crossover region and uh, make it impossible to really mix the low end. And so this, for me, has always been the big question. Why don't we have a solution to this problem when you, when you can't really, where you can't really tie in subwoofers reliably into your main systems unless you really fulfill these very, very specific requirements? I don't know. And then there's volume calibration, right? So setting the volume trim, if you will, a kind of a trim knob for the volume on each of your outputs for your interface. Why? Well, if you've ever used the volume knob on your speaker, you may have noticed that in some cases they're very, very coarse, stepped. Sometimes the steps aren't perfectly calibrated. And so you end up having two speakers set at the same volume, but they're not at the same volume. <laughs> that happens more frequently than I'd like. And then obviously, depending on the room geometry, one speaker may actually be reinforced in certain parts of the spectrum and appear louder to you, shifting the 
stereo center to one side. And the easiest way to compensate that is by just adjusting the volume on that speaker. So it's an essential tool in a home studio to align your speakers in terms of stereo panorama, in terms of stereo center, making sure that really sits in the middle. So it's those three features that are really essential to calibrating speakers in a home studio. Parametric EQ, and no, uh, the settings on your speaker, on the back of your speakers aren't enough. We need full control over frequency, gain, and Q, and then delay on each channel in order to tie in a subwoofer mainly, but also potentially to align your speakers, and then volume in order to potentially compensate for asymmetries in your home studio, and obviously, obviously setting a, vo a, um, a, a sub at the right volume. So with all that, the obvious answer to me is always, okay, this needs to happen in the audio interface, right? I mean, if you've ever mingled with these implementations built into speakers, and by the way, they've done a decent job. Yeah, A lot of them have done a decent job. Uh, in many ways, they've probably done the best job they can, but it's very, very clunky just f because of the fact that you often have to get to the back of the speaker and calibrate each speaker individually potentially hooking up a cable, installing some extra software on your laptop, on your computer, then hooking up the next speaker. It's very clunky. It's not convenient at all. Obviously, the place to do it is in the interface for, well, in the, in the, <laughs> in the visual interface for your audio interface. And like I said, it always obviously comes with that added benefit of not adding any extra latency either. I know that some of these software packages come with kind of a zero latency functionality but it's still much less convenient than just having it built into the conversion that already exists in your system and then there's that huge massive benefit on top of that is that by definition if you have this functionality built in you kind of make your interface a monitor controller as well so setting volume for your entire system being able to mute and dim either individual speakers or the entire system volume matching different speaker pairs or speaker systems so for example headphones and your main speaker and sub setup and your mono speaker and your hi-fi system that you've got set up somewhere in the room right so you could have all of those hooked up to the same interface all calibrated all volume matched and then switch between them at the push of a button and if you've kind of gone through the process of setting something up for yourself like that, uh, then you probably know just how beneficial that is to mixing, right? I mean, it is so, this whole this whole question of monitoring volume, I'm not gonna get into right now, but it is extremely important that you, vo that you monitor at a comfortable volume for mixing at ex uh, over extended periods, and then switching between different speaker systems at a match volume is also critical to being able to actually make apples to apples comparison between them, if you will. So hopefully by now you understand how or why I got so excited when I saw this understated post by RME saying that they've now integrated room EQ delay and volume calibration into their latest update to their Total, M uh, total Mix FX software package. Unfortunately, it still only runs on their flagship interfaces, but heck, at least they're giving it a go. And obviously the reasoning behind this whole thing is that they're now preparing their interfaces for Dolby Atmos. Why it needed this transition, if we can already call it a transition to Dolby Atmos, why we needed the spread of this to finally get this type of implementation into our interfaces, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that most people will still be using that functionality simply for their stereo and sub setups because it is just as useful for those than any Dolby Atmos setup. Heck, at least they're doing it. And then in kind of researching what the state is with the, all the other manufacturers, I came across the new Audient Aurea, which is also a dedicated Dolby Atmos interface, which comes with a, a similar kind of setup, parametric EQ, delay, and volume trim, in my opinion, it's not as well thought out, let's say, as the RME solution. Hopefully that will change with a future update. Just to mention a few things, it doesn't offer 
a uh, proper low cut or high cut as far as I understand or low shelf and high shelf plus the um, settings on the delay dial are very large stepped. You really need very fine adjustments of delay in order to make this useful. We'll see in practice how, how that turns out and maybe they'll make some changes as they go through uh, updating their software. In any case, still super cool. And seeing this really gives me hopes that this is going to be more widely imp implemented. In fact, if you work for a manufacturer of audio interfaces and you're seeing this, let me just kind of pass on that I'd really like to see this type of implementation, parametric EQ, delay, and volume implemented on all interfaces as a standard on their outputs, if not all, maybe just kind of the main stereo outputs plus like, or maybe four outputs so you can really tie in a subwoofer as well. But it is just so useful to get that functionality into your interface, not having to rely on extra software or having to rely on speaker manufacturers building it into their speakers. That would be super awesome. And obviously, if you have one of these interfaces, go check it out. I think it is one of the most useful features in these interfaces in order to make your system adapt to your home studio. All right, with that, as always, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.